You are listening to Faithless Brewing, a Magic the Gathering podcast for the Spike Road. Each week we design new decks for tournament play. We put our creations to the test and share our findings on the air. Today we present our top five cards to brew from Phyrexia All Will Be One, plus picks of the week in Modern, and a look at Rivaz of the Claw. All of that and more is coming up on Faithless Brewing. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. to the Faithless Brewing Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Schriever, also known as Cave Dan, and I'm joined today all the way from Buenos Aires, Argentina. You know him as Mord to Light. It's Emmy Sagasti. Emmy, welcome. Hey, yo. Hey, Dan. How is everybody doing? Love to be here tonight on this hot, beautiful Friday, Friday afternoon. It is a glorious day today. We had like this major ice storm in Austin the last couple days, and boy, everything was wrecked. We lost power for a full day. It didn't seem like it was going to be a big deal, like there wasn't that much snow, but apparently all these old trees in the neighborhood are just full of creaky branches. So as soon as the ice got on them and the wind picked up, like just branches were falling left and right, and it knocked out all these power lines. A giant tree fell on our car, which was very annoying. Yeah, super sorry to hear that. Yeah. Yeah, devastating. So, trying to piece things together, but the power is back on, the internet is working, and I finally was able to jump into the Magic Online Leagues for the first time in what felt like a very long time. So things are looking up. And that's what matters in the end. So I really hope everything with insurance goes correctly, because we all know how how annoying that can be. Yeah, exactly. What's new with you? For me, well, everything is going for now well. Applied for a customer support job at Mana Traders, got through all the three interviews and just hoping to hear from them again. It's only been a few days, so hopes are still up. After that, I just have been focusing on magic, taking things day to day, and all's been great. Oh, Mana Traders, excited for that. Sending you energy. Thanks, thanks. And yeah, for now, everything's been good, but... You know, when, you're, when it comes to interviews, you're always sweating till you get the okay. It doesn't matter how well anything went. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if you do get this position, that means you would be, like, what, customer support, right? So you'd yeah. be the person that we complain to. You could complain straight up to me via mana traders. It would make it easier to complain about the game. <laughs> well, excited for that. Uh, we do have a big show planned. So we're going to get to some actual magic content in a minute here. But before we dive in, we'll get a little housekeeping out of the way at the top. A reminder that if you enjoy the podcast and want to throw us some support, want a direct channel to come complain to us, the best Mm -hmm. way to do that is by hopping into our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash faithlessbrewing. Make a pledge at any tier you're comfortable with. Gets you immediate access to our wonderful Discord community, as well as other fun perks. We have merch. We have votes where you can vote on cards that we're going to brew the last card we chose was rivaz of the claw and did a little testing with that which i'll tell you about later in the show we also have one new patron we'd like to welcome that is jan so a big thank you thank you for your support and welcome to the faithless family exactly thank you so much and hope to see you in the discord welcome to the family all right mord what's the latest in mtg well, the latest in MTG. Worldwide, we had a new setup for what's going to be competitive play. It seems like from now on, RCQ seasons will only have one single seasonal format alongside Limited, which means if they're RCQ's Pioneer, you will only be able to qualify via Pioneer or Limited events. And after a complaint from Mengu, complaining that this was really harmful to modern players, Play MTG replied with, we heard your complaints, and we would like to let you know that everything is fine. We're not forgetting about modern, and season five is modern. So Mengu was complaining because season four 
which is the first season with this system, is going to be Pioneer. Is that correct? Yeah. And it has always been Pioneer or Standard, which meant if it was never modern, there would be no more PTQs, sorry, PPTQs with modern or any big tournaments with modern. So they went ahead. So this was in a comment to this post in Twitter, and they immediately commented to Mengu, letting him know fifth season will be modern. And it's worth noting fifth season is around July, September, which is right after Lord of the Rings hits us with that modern glory. Oh, okay. So we're going to have Lord of Horizons already in our hands by the time we're playing a modern PTQ. Will that be great? Will that suck? Only time will tell, but I will only know that Lord of the Rings will sell better than any set in history. Mordor Horizons. Mordor Horizons. So three seasons per year, right? So should we assume one Pioneer, one Modern, one Standard? That's likely the goal, at least I hope so, and always limited. Like, you can always qualify via playing limited. If there's a store near you running a limited event, of exactly. course. Exactly. They leave that to the discretion of the local stores. For the most part, I think I like the idea behind the change. We've been saying for years now that we've lost the sense of community, the sense of shared purpose. And a lot of that is just that even if you and I are both competitive players trying to be in you know, the organized play scene, we might not care about the same formats at the same time. And yeah, you know, that just makes it hard to feel excitement about like working on something together or cracking a format. So they made this change because people asked for it. Yeah. People wanted to be able to play different things. And it seems like people are excited for it. At least I saw most replies, most in our Discord, being fairly positive. It all sounds good until we get to standard season and then we realize that we have to play standard. <laughs> I mean, that's what it comes down to. It's all fun and games until you're forced to play a format or asked to care about a format that you just don't want to play. Here we already were, like most 21st were already pioneer here, so not much changed. Mm. But yeah, it seems like a good change, and just hearing it's gonna be modern was super exciting. Like, that was the best part about it for us. How interesting. That just goes to show how different it can be regionally and locally, because when I hear this, I'm thinking, oh, well, most of the qualifiers are modern, <laughs> at least that I've seen, so this will at least get more focus on pioneer for a while, which... I think it could be good. We'll see how it goes. I mean, we're still in the early stages of this entire system. I think the first actual paper pro tour is coming up in just like two weeks from now. Yeah, super close. They're not advertising it, but we hope it's good. <laughs> we can only hope it's going to be amazing. And after that, before we get into the main topic of today, discussing not only the cards we're excited for Phyrexia and the decks we like the most... I wanted to talk about something, a small thing about Paper Magic that I had yesterday at an event. And because I wanted to hear your opinion about it, it's going to take five minutes and then we can go straight to the modern and pioneer in hand. So yesterday, yesterday I was at a Pioneer FNM. I wasn't going to go, but one hour before the event, the, the store is literally 300 meters from my house and, I, and a friend was like, I have three decks, what do you want? And I was like, okay, if you're going to make me go, I'm going to go. <laughs> so I just took up Mono Green Devotion because I wanted to test it for once. And I took it to the FNM, got crushed, that's not what matters. So I guess both my opponents, I could tell they were sort of new either to the format. Clearly the format, not the game. And when they made slight pants, I always was super quick to let them know. To actually let them go back on it. For example, my opponent on Mono White, no cards in hand, casts a Talia's Lieutenant and doesn't activate the Mutavolt before. Or empty handed, they swing and they don't attack with a Mutavolt, and I literally, because we were kidding, we were having a good mood, I literally go ahead, stretch my hand, tap his planes, and put the Mutavolt on the attacker zone. Okay. And I felt like that was regular etiquette with new players. Try to help them realize the mistake and try to help them get better. And. Less than two minutes after like this whole debacle, this whole not debacle, this whole shenanigans, I had a similar situation with my previous opponent, who was playing Mono Black Devotion. I heard a player playing against my old opponent, and they were like sort of a small argument, slightly heated about how he didn't mean it in a bad way. And yeah, he knew he might miss the graveyard trespass triggers because he had my the opponent had missed it twice already, and on the second time he hadn't even let him know. 
like on purpose omitted information that the opponent missed a gravity trespasser tree, and he said it with a sense of sense of weird pride, right? Like you missed it, and I realized, and I was shocked by that. So you're talking about an argument between the player that you had just played, the newer player, and then their next round opponent. Yeah. Okay, so different matchup entirely. Different matchup, and yeah, it was weird. Like I will never let my opponent miss a trigger at FNM. Like I don't think that would even cross my mind. We're talking about literally twisted nine magic, where the entry is three bucks and the price is eight dollars for the first place. Sixteen players. There's nothing on the line. Literally, a small pizza and a coke from that same place is what you can get if you win that tournament. You're paying for less than a pizza. So did you did you follow up with either of these people? Did you talk to them about what was happening? No, no. Like The player that actually realized his opponent was missing triggers used to be a friend of mine that we started away, and he was really super competitive and like literally at FNMs, and that was something I generally didn't agree with. But just hearing, discussing with a player he didn't even know was shocking. It was a position where I think I would never see myself in. Was he doing it from a place of, like, tough love? Like, no, 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 he wanted to win. Let them know that this is what's expected, or no, is no, he just no. doing it for himself? I mean, it shouldn't be expected. I knew my mono white opponent was never going to play a pro tour because he played the game in a way I was not able to. He was playing the game as a game. I see. And neither did the other opponent. They weren't competing. They weren't trying to show they were the best. They were bored at 7.30 p.m. on a Wednesday night on a Thursday night, and they went to play and drink a, a beer at the store. Nothing else. And I could never see myself in a position where I would make them forget the triggers or would actually not remind them, and I'm trying to see if I'm the only one in that boat. No, I don't think you're the only one. It's just so interesting. You know, we, we spend almost every episode talking about strategy and how cards work and like theorizing metagames, but... When it's time to actually sit down and play someone, at least in paper, it's, it's almost not about that at all, right? It's about emotions and just like what kind of day you're having, how the game makes you feel. When I faced that first opponent, I literally gave them a Power Stone token. I cast the 8 mana Cityscape Leveler and they were like, this is useless. And I started reminding them, no, you can use that on the Black Castle. A lot of people, if they didn't play the limited set of that, they forget Power Stones are actually super useful for a bunch of stuff. They had Mystery Shadow, Black Castle, they had a lot of ways to use that mana. And I would never feel myself happy by letting them forget it. Like, I could never see my opponent tapping that lance and not tapping the Power Stone and actually feeling like I would enjoy the game. This is all at an FNM, of course. Like, I'm talking completely at the lowest of lowest of players levels yeah so regarding your initial question about what about the the next round opponent the one who was taking pride in noticing his opponent missing triggers i think we can agree that that player is not doing much good for the community <laughs> right there and should maybe you know rethink about like how they're going to relax on a friday night rethink their approach i'm curious though what you're describing when, when you're playing against newer players like this and you're pointing out these things to them to help them, you know, to help them see like, okay, don't forget about this or try sequencing it this way. Do people respond well to that? Yeah, yeah, always. Because I've also been in situations where like that is taken badly, you know, if it's done in a, such a way that makes the new player feel like they're being looked down on. I never do it from a place of... The thing is, I never do it from a place of pride. I do it from a place of... I noticed you didn't notice this, and it's fine. Hmm. That's fine. This is something... I'm not looking at their hand, I'm not playing for them, and I'm not... If they make a small misplay, I'm not telling them, hey, you can do this better. But if they omit something, they don't realize something, because that's a lot more common for newer players, you realize, like, when a newer player is playing mono-white, they will not make, like, huge punts most of the time. Like, they are not going to attack randomly. But they are going to forget about Lethal with Chef Dunes. They are not going to realize activity in Mutable before Talia's Lieutenant is actually a good play. I'm not going to let them know, hey, you could have attacked for Lethal because that's... Or maybe I will after the game even. But I'm not going to discuss what they will do. I'm actually just letting them know, hey, this is something you can do and I'm open if you want to do it. I think it comes from how you express it. Always, 
if you express it with like pride or like trying to pull them off or like trying to show to try to make them feel like they have to thank you, I think they can reply poorly. And if someone ever says, I don't need help, I will stop doing it, of course. But I have never had someone like asking me not to. Yeah. And that makes sense. I mean, I like the way that you, you know, explain that you're joking around, you're having a good time. And I think that's the main thing, right? You're also playing a game, but that's kind of secondary. And my opponent knows, my opponent realized if I spend 25 minute game talking about random stuff and we're discussing stuff as we play the game, or my opponent makes an attack and I ask them, does that card in your hand make four because it's an Igancho and they have to laugh because it might be a bluff or it might be not and we're teasing about the game, we're not focusing on who's winning. That's why they don't take it badly if I try to help them because they can tell I don't care if I win this game or they win this game. Not today. Yeah, I think this is a good reminder. Well, for me, it's a good reminder that, you know, as we're coming out of the era of COVID and things being online, I think a lot of us have gotten used to just engaging with magic in a way that is not over the board, right? Like I, I talk to people online, I'm in the Discord, I'm watching streamers, I'm playing magic online, I'm thinking about combinations of cards and strategies. And it's just so far removed from the person-to-person social experience of like actually going to a store, trying to meet people, trying to make friends and establish community. That's the part that's the most in danger if we don't actively work toward it. And I know we don't really talk about that very often on this yeah. podcast, so I'm glad you bring up this example. Just a good reminder of like, hey, try to be more like Mord in these situations. <laughs> you know, Welcome the new people. Make sure they have a nice experience. Yeah. Make sure they come back next time. The opponent was like that old archetype of player, you know, old player, has been playing long before I was born, never really cared about the game, has no idea what Lotusfield does, doesn't care. He has been playing longer than I have ever lived, will likely play longer than I will ever be, and he's just playing the game. He's just out of Wednesday night. He doesn't care about the meta, he doesn't care about what I will build, he doesn't care about my mono... When I comboed him out on game 2, he didn't even ask to see the combo. I told him... I was just letting you know if I untap, you are milled out. And he was like, okay, and collected his cards. <laughs> no doubt in his mind. Yeah. And that's, I think, what magic should be, at least for people learning, for people starting to play the game, for us getting together on a Wednesday night. I don't want to come on a Wednesday night and have to focus on, oh, I forgot to, act- to activate my Muda Vault. I'm sorry. Will you allow me to go back? I shouldn't. Yeah, I hear you. I mean, I'm in the process of trying to find a new local store for myself, right? Just moved to a new city. I went to the F&M for the first time last week. Yeah, I mean, I've been in this situation a bunch of times in different cities, but it's always like there's nerves involved. You're a little uncertain trying to feel out the social scene, try to see what the vibe is like in the store. And little things like this can make a difference. A little kindness, a little extra step to, you know, make it a more welcoming environment for whoever it is that can pay dividends. Yeah, it's just trying to make the game better so people will come. I know Ram well if my, one of my first experiences was with someone not reminding me my triggers, letting them go, and then on the end telling me I panted on a looking at me from a Bob way, I'm not sure if I would have returned. Yeah, I hear you. Exactly. But ignoring the FNM shenanigans, we can go straight to the real meat of the the real meat of the table, which is what are we gonna build in the next weeks? <laughs> Enough about all that messy human stuff. Let's just talk about theoretical brews that we'll never actually play, but that are exciting to think about. The opposite of us real humans at FNM. So we've talked for about three and a half, four hours total during our set review about all the cards we liked for Modern and Pioneer. It's a lot. So what we like to do after that is have a little segment where we step back and just try to isolate the things that stand out the most to us. Top fives. And sometimes that's predictions for the most impactful cards. Today, we're just going to do the cards that are most exciting to us, to you and me, as brewers. Hmm. Yeah. So, Dan, want me to start, or are you willing to go for your first five? Well, I'm actually just looking at our list. We actually have mostly the same cards on here. Yeah, we're super close. Literally 4-4-4, four, 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 and the fifth one I have in my HMs, and you, and you likely do on the other. 
And yeah, so sticking to a contract super close, let's talk about the card. I think personally I'm the most excited about, and I think David is also the most excited about, so we are going to hear a lot more about this card soon, which is Tybar. The jubilant brawler. Just look at that guy. He's so happy to be fighting fists. Golgari Planeswalker, three mana, gives haste to your tappers and untaps your tappers and brings them back from the graveyard while milling yourself. Yeah. So David is excited for shenanigans in Pioneer. I'm excited for shenanigans in both Modern and Pioneer. I want to play this in... I want to play this in Devoted Druid. I want to play this in Goblins. I want to play this with Fiend Artisan. I want to play this in a Toolbox deck. And I'm going to destroy my ticket stockpile doing this. What I really like about it is just that it's asking me to look for something that I haven't looked for in a long time. Like, find creatures with tap abilities. Yeah. When was the last time we had to, like, search for cards like that? It's been forever. Yeah, there hasn't been much upside in that. Yeah, it's like the opposite of how we think of creatures these days. We think if you want to be a playable creature, you have to provide your value with an ETB trigger. Immediate value. And a tapper is like, okay, the opposite of that. It needs to come into play, it needs to survive a turn, and then next turn I will tap it instead of attacking or blocking to do something with it. So tappers or creatures that provide something when tapped... They've been on the down and out for a while, so I'm just excited to see what Tyvar brings to them. I don't want to say too much about it, because this is actually the first card we're going to brew with. I think uh, David has already whipped up hmm. four or five Tyvar lists in Pioneer alone, so you'll be hearing a lot more about Tyvar soon. I mean, yeah, and in Pioneer, stuff like turn one dork, turn two, Tyvar, turn three, Banifar win the game. That's what games are for. I hope it's not just that. I'll put it that way. <laughs> but that reminds me... That's uh, if you are interested in like seeing some decks like this, we did publish a new article on faithisbrewing.com, free to read. You can go there right now. I'll drop a link in the episode description. It's got about 15 new decks that David has whipped up after our preview episodes, and he does have a Vanifar pod list with uh, Tyvar in there, so you can see one example of how to build that deck right now on our website if you like. Exactly. And in modern, I'm going to do all my beautiful shenanigans. After that, we both have the beautiful Venerated Rod Priest, which is not our style of card, but it has so much brewing mechanical energy, like all that brewing potential energy, which has transformed into kinetic energy. <laughs> it's in our hands to push it down the roller coaster and give it that kinetic momentum. Right, venerated Rod Priest is like the ball, like at the very top of the, the slide. Right? Look, at all, <laughs> all look at all that potential! <laughs> <laughs> we were initially thinking all right does this fit into an effect maybe the infect players will answer that but seeing the, the different approaches people have taken to a dedicated rob priest combo deck is just exciting to see like i don't actually know if i will enjoy playing such a deck myself but i want to see it yeah i just want to see it i mean i've been looking at um some builds that spencer in our discord has put together testing with the summoner's pact and Underworld Breach, the Manamorphose, you can Summoner's Pack for a Goblin and an Archimancer. Hmm. It's so compact, right? Like, this is, this is a modern, by the way. You're trying to set up the Grape Shot or Ground Rift. What blew my mind with this combo is how far, like, you have the Summoner's Pack and the Venerator Priest. If you can go something like Turn 3, Pack, Rod Priest, Rod Priest, Vistra Bubble, Ground Rift, it's a Turn 3 literal all of a sudden with no board or button tapped out once and you're dead. Yeah, exactly. And that's not even getting into, okay, do we want the spell kites or not? Or are those too slow? Right? How many lands are we playing? Can yeah. we get away with 16, 17 lands? 16. I've seen people building pioneer versions. I've seen standard versions getting proposed using uh, Ivy, the 2-1 the pixie or fairy that copies spells. Oh, spicy. But yeah, we have a lot of things to try, and I'm super excited just for that card because I hope it sprouts a new archetype. Of course, this is going to lead... If that archetype is actually cool, you're going to be hearing from me back in April complaining about how the archetype is super annoying to play against. But that's for more in the future to talk about. Yeah, we have to express our excitement now before it becomes annoying. Yeah. If it actually succeeds in becoming an archetype, it's going to be kind of obnoxious. Hmm. <laughs> but that's okay. It's kind of like um, Neo Brand, right? It's like the first time you see it, it's like the puzzle is solved. And then after that, it's like, I hope I never see this card again. <laughs> Exactly. I want you to see the 501s, prove each other, go top 32 in a challenge and forget about it. 
So the next card that is on your list is actually the top card on my list, and that is Capricious Hellraiser. Three red, red, red for a 4-4 four, four dragon. You can get a discount. You can get it for just the three red if you have nine or more cards in your graveyard. But what's really exciting is this Enter the Battlefield trigger randomly recasts a non-creature spell from your graveyard. With some conditions, right? You you have to like hit that card. You you randomly exile three, so you don't want the graveyard to be too big if you're trying to specifically reanimate something. It's such a tricky card, Mord. So Spike was really hyping this card up, which made it interesting. He's talking about it as the new Blood Red Elf. As a card, you can consistently play on turn four or five for three mana and get a two or three mana spell out of it. I mean, the new Blood Red Elf is not a huge endorsement. <laughs> no, no, but he's saying it's a lot better than BBE, which is weird. Because I don't think it's as... Cons- you, you can't consistently get eight or nine, car- nine cards in your graveyard as consistently as he thinks. But I can see the potential if that's true. It's so interesting because it's like he's seeing something entirely different. Because after I was thinking through these scenarios, I concluded that we should think of this as a six mana card. Like, yes, you, you can try to set up the three mana version and then you have to accept the randomness of maybe I won't hit anything good. Or, you know, maybe I'll just cast a lightning bolt. But I have kind of concluded that just like a 4-4 four, four flyer by itself is not super impressive. I don't just want a broodmate dragon like I, I want to actually get back something really really impressive so i kind of like set the bar at it needs to be better than you know two four fours it needs to be better than torrential gear hulk yeah that's kind of narrowing it down for me this is this is a, probably going to be a, a pioneer card six mana as i'm describing it but that's totally plausible that you can also have the three mana version the new blood braid elf that spike is describing yeah, exactly. And that is, I think, super interesting. Like, a 3-mana 4-4 four, four that even casts a Consider... With, like, 3-mana 4-4 four, four Haste, if I can cast it on turn 4 or 5 and get a Consider out of it, I'm fine with it. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting. If, if you're going to focus on reanimation, maybe you don't care about a 4-4, four, four. but if you're just thinking, I'm going to enable it and just be an attacking deck, then, yeah, yeah. it's like a totally different card in that scenario. All of a sudden, it's pressuring and being useful. Yeah, exactly. And if you want to go like the Torrential Gear Hulk route, you find that there's cards that where it duplicates the Gear Hulk effect. So if, if you want to yeah. recast Magma Opus, sure. But there's also cards that the Gear Hulk can't touch, but the Capricious Hulk can, right? Do you want Omniscience? Do you want Portal to Phyrexia? Do you want Emergent Ultimatum? Do you want Treasure Cruise? Do you want a Planeswalker? Do you want like just like a Chandra? There's all kinds of stuff that... It's just so weird to think about reanimation in red for these weird classes of cards. Yeah. So yeah, Hellkite is a super interesting one, both as a combo enabler, like a th- six mana cast an omniscience, or maybe just the new BBE, as Spike said. I think that is both open. And then we have our last card in common, which is Atraxa. The big bad reanimator target or Neo from Target, or whatever. I think we would like it for similar reasons. We want to see it to play, but at the same time, we don't want it to play with bad cards. We both want to Neo from this and play a mid-range deck. I haven't settled on Neo form yet. Like, I'm wondering if... Like, there's a paradox there. Right? Neo form is a bad card, and it asks yeah. you to play bad setup cards, so maybe that's just, like, the wrong way to do Atraxa. Because I think what is good about Atraxa unlike Niv Mizzet Reborn, is that you don't have to do any kind of weird deck building. Your normal deck will have enough diversity to make a Traxa hit three, four, five cards. Yeah. Like, you're never going to hit less than three or four with a Traxa. Like, land, sorcery, instant, plus creature, or land, sorcery, instant, artifact. You're always going to find stuff. It's ten cards deep with really general need and requirements. And the body dominates the battlefield. That's the other thing. It's so huge. it's not that they can't kill Atraxa, right? You're not just going to win just with an Atraxa. But an Atraxa that also replenished your hand, I feel like that is enough of... Yeah, and like something like humans, it's never going to win through an Atraxa. And if they cut at it and you can remove it again, how do you win through a 7-7 vision and slightly could flyer? Right, so it's a question, right? I don't know what the best way to get Atraxa into play yet is like i imagine that i have to do something to cheat it but maybe the correct approach is to just ramp 
like do a slow ramp survive yeah grow spiral exactly get a grow spiral just play like a bant or sultai deck with a soft splash in the fourth color and go for that the extra treasure from fable the mirror breaker get one treasure there get one other ramp somewhere else and you have a turn five atrexa and that yeah probably will win the game the only problem is how are you playing F Fable in your non-red for color deck and just going for five color in Pioneer is going to struggle. It's going to be a challenge. I mean, that's what makes Attractive interesting. Yeah. I feel like the power is so obvious and yet it's not obvious at all to me like how to get there. And I think that no one has solved this yet as far as I can tell. I haven't seen that many people proposing decks. Barely any, actually. And I think to some extent people are still sleeping on the card because... They have not decided that it's worth it to try really hard to get Atraxa into play. Yeah. I mean, it's Gristlebrand and Nimizit in the same card. What's not to like? What's not to love? And then it will at least stop being the same. My fifth card being Nahiri the Unforgiven, the beautiful Boros Planeswalker. Why do I love it? I don't know. Just a cheap way to get back stuff. I think it works super well with Tivar in an eight Planeswalker shell with the Boded Druid or such. And maybe I'm insane, but I think time will tell. And you have the beautiful new staple for red. Yeah, for me, Gleeful Demolition was my last slot, but I mean, I like Nahiri as well. I think that we both liked it during our preview episodes. Kind of similar space to Tyvar. Like, they both will benefit a lot from having cheap creatures to reanimate, but Nahiri is in a totally different color set. Yeah. Has that kind of weird equipment angle if you want it. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, her rummaging just plays totally differently. So... Two different three mana planeswalker options to reanimate your creatures for value between Tyvar and Nahiri. We love doing that. We love getting back two drops for value. Nahiri can do stuff like you go turn to Stoneforge, it dies, turn three Nahiri, plus it survives into turn four, into turn four, get back Stoneforge and Kaldra, like with haste. On the other hand, Gleeful Demolition, single red sorcery, destroys an artifact, makes goblins. Again, not the kind of card that I usually play, but it's playing in that space of, like, self-sacrifice. Or, you know, maybe you're making goblins, maybe you're bushwhacking, maybe you're doing a rune-developed horde master thing. We love the experimental synthesizer. The card is finally getting a little more respect. You know, people have started playing this uh, modern version of, like, a mono-red or sometimes a mono-red splash into green galvanic blast-type aggro deck with the synthesizer. And it's just a strong card that you do need some way to get rid of it for profits. In a format like Pioneer, the Demolition is one of the more efficient ways to do that. Yeah. Again, for like a simple card, right, one mana, it seems to only do one thing. It actually does several things and invites you to build several different styles of decks in different formats. Yeah, it incentivizes that aggro bushwalker deck that was popular in the past and it's a bit dead, but also acting as a way to remove artifacts like a snaring bridge when needed, which is a beautiful versatility we hadn't seen. And lastly, I have as a honorable mention a card we haven't even read before, which is Ikormun Gauntlet. Just because of how weird and insane it is. So it's two in a blue artifact. Planeswalkers you control gain two additional loyalty abilities. They gain zero proliferate, and they gain minus 12 take an extra turn. Separate from that ability, Icar Moon Gauntlet also says that whenever you cast a non-creature spell, choose a counter on target permanent and then put an additional counter of that kind on that permanent. So presumably if you're, if you're thinking Planeswalkers, it just gives you extra loyalty on a Planeswalker. What do you like about this card? I don't know. I think it's... I don't, just thinking about the possibilities of if you have two or three planeswalkers, every single one is giving each planeswalker plus three plus three every turn, right? Yeah, but, I mean, okay, that, <laughs> we've been fooled by this kind of thing before. We oh, yeah. Played, uh, the Strixhaven Kiora, I forget, what's the name of that Kiora? Oh, yeah. The really bad one. No, it's not that Kiora, it's Kasmina. That's it, Kasmina. The three mana Kasmina from Strixhaven who, again, grants extra abilities, actually very similar abilities yeah. to other Planeswalkers. Random fact, Kasmina might actually be super relevant to the plot, as she has been said to have like a small cult of random Planeswalkers no one knows about. Like, she's making, grabbing people that Spark has not been triggered and forcing them to trigger the Spark. She's like a cultist Planeswalkers cult. Oh, God. Like, she's torturing them until they Spark? Yeah. That kind of thing? Oh, God. <laughs> 
So they might pop up to irrelevant. Okay, well, Kazmina in that iteration was quite bad, but the reason that it didn't work out well for me was that it's just so hard to keep Planeswalkers in play. The, the disparity of being on the play versus being on the draw Oh yeah, is so painful. So I think that for me is like, when I see Kirk Moon Gauntlet, I kind of shy away like I've been burned before. <laughs> like my, I feel the scars and the burns of lost tickets when I see this card. Oh yeah, but that's the beauty. Uh, yeah, sadly, I don't think Gauntlet will see any play, any real play, but it's a super gorgeous card. And from there, we can go straight to our modern predicts of the week, which has a beautiful spice that managed to they know somehow. <laughs> so we've each picked a deck that we have liked from around the web. Mord, we want to start with you. I mean, actually, this is a deck that you like so much that you yourself play. <laughs> I, I went through the super unhumble choice of picking my own deck. I mean, you've been crushing with this 10-0 run in, in the modern leagues with this. You'd love to see that. Yeah, so over the past few weeks, there was like a resurgence. There was like the first important moment, seismic moment in the Goblins variants. Since before I started playing Goblins, the only real shells have been like the Ragdos one and the Shund one, where the only difference is if you are playing foreign noble hierarchs or not. The rest of the deck has remained completely static. 4 Snoop, 4 Munitions Expert, 4 Bial, 22 or 23 Lands, 4 Matrons, 2 Ring Leaders, 2 Kiki, just the exact 2 shawl every single time. And all of a sudden, in a small Japanese tournament by some unknown player, they played like this super weird all-in combo deck list that played like Dirty Kitty, with the 4th Kick, 4th Horde Master and 8 Cost Reducers, whose only plan was to try and go off with that combo. So Dirty Kitty is slaying, referring to a deck that is playing Skirk Prospector and something that triggers when your creatures die. Yeah, that used to be Fecundity. Fecundity was in the original version. But now you have Runevelt Horde Master. So whenever you sack a goblin to your Prospector to make a mana, you also sort of draw a card. Yeah, so that version was super consistent on going off turn 3 or 4. You get your Skirk, your Horde Master, and a Cost Reducer, and Mogwar Marshal, and Warren... What's the name of the two mana? Two mana one one make another one one. So the man, bad Mogwar Marshal become one mana dark ritual that also draws you three cards. Matron becomes two mana draw four gain four. These lines exist within the Goblin tribe, but in order to like really make them happen, you do have to like dedicate the slots to the cost reducer, and I think that's yeah. what the, the stock Goblins build basically didn't want to do before exactly it just focused a lot on playing more of a mid-range game or a full-on combo deck with no plus harbinger so after having some mild success with success with that deck list i went had a couple for ones a couple two threes and such i was like okay there's something here there's not enough what if we try and combine both versions but then i'm a bit out of slots so my reasoning became whenever i have a horde master plus a skirk it's as good as having a Harbinger in most scenarios. Harbinger plus Kirk is going to let you look at the top of your deck enough where you're going to either find a Matron, a Harbinger, or a Kiki Shiki before you run out of value and you can combo with your Snoop. So you're saying that just having one Horde Master and one Skirk Prospector represents access to the top three to five cards yeah. off the top of your deck if you need them? Super consistently, yeah, it will. Which allows you to just... Sometimes you just start going off. You have like, you went turn one by I'll turn two Horde Master plus Violina Skirk. And turn three, you just play a Matron and go and went go get a Snoop. Turn four, you started, you don't have a Harbinger or anything. Your Snoop doesn't have haste or anything. And you just start going, okay, play a Mogwar Marshal, suck, suck. Find a Matron, play a Matron, suck, play a Warchief, um, play a Frog Tosser, suck it, play Snoop, look at the top, find Kiki, go off. So looking at the deck, the curve is very low. You're playing four copies of Prospector, War Marshal, Runefeld Horde Master, Snoop, Goblin Matron. But do you ever attack for lethal, or is it just a combo deck in disguise? You tend to attack a lot for lethal. Like, most of your wins are just, like, going throw one by turn two, no War Marshal, plus one drop, turn three, Goblin Matron, plus two drop into Double Lord on turn four. Or sometimes you just go, like, Frog Tosser, Horde Master, Matron, Horde Master, and just swarm your opponent. But you don't really have that many lords, it's just Horde Master. And I guess you have one Sling Gang, one Patch Lickmons. 
the thing with goblins is damage does really add up. Your opponent fetch shocks down to 17 and you play a Mogwar Marshal getting for 2, they're down to 15. Next turn you play a Horn Master and a Bannonet swing for 6, they're down to 9. You have 4 goblins on board. That means Sling and Lieutenant is almost lethal already. If they ever take 1 point of damage, you buy a Lina Lieutenant and they're dead. Lieutenant tends to win new games just because your opponent goes to 8 or 9 and there's no way to stabilize a board against goblins because if you can't finish the game, the lieutenant will get you. And you sometimes you just get a Pashalik one, so you buy in a Pashalik one and you have a skill prospector, so you swing and sacrifice everything. So I'm keen to try this deck, particularly because it actually is quite cheap. It's quite affordable as far as modern deck goes. Oh yeah. As long as you're willing to compromise a little bit on a mana base. Your mana base is playing four Cavern of Souls and four Auntie's Hovel, which is a red-black goblin land that is like $25 each and is only played in this deck. The only reason you need the Auntie's Hovel is for the Blood Moon on the side and the Thought Seasons. If not, it's strictly worse than a secluded courtier. Yeah, I was wondering if I should just replace that with a Black Leaf Cliffs or more fetch lands. Yeah, Black League Cliffs works perfectly, four Black League Cliffs works perfectly, or any red fetch land because I'm not even playing a Swamp. I'm all in on the grid. So if you're like a boomer modern player like myself, who, you know, maintained the collection between the years 2015 and 2019, <laughs> this is not that expensive to acquire the missing pieces, right? Horde yeah. Masters are fairly cheap right now. They're, they're actually about two bucks each on TCG Player, which is underpriced, I think. All the goblins are super cheap. Snoops are about 4 or $5 each. And these cards have proven themselves at this point. They're, they've proven themselves in many formats, so you might as well just pick up your play sets. Uh, the rest of the deck, I guess the only other expensive card is Kiki Jiki, and yeah. you probably already have other vials if you care about creature decks. The deck felt amazing. I crushed every single combo deck. I crushed Murktide. I crushed... Against Murktide, I always win via combat damage. You never get to combo against Murktide. The fact Ragavan is textless in the matchup because of Mogwar Marshall. The fact they can never tap down comfortably because there was a moment where they were, where they were at 8 and I had 4 cards in hand, 2 vials, and I stopped playing creatures. I had them bolt random 1-1s one and such to connect, and all of a sudden I went like, tap in vial, war chief, core master, core master, mog, swing for 10. <laughs> the fact with like 1 vial and 3 mana you can cast, what was that? You, I had 2-2-2s, two, 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 a 4-4, four, four, and 2-3-3s, three, three, it was 14 points of damage, all hasty. And if anything died, I get to Divination for any, every creature they kill. So the deck looks super sweet, super fun, and you've been getting amazing results with it. I did want to ask you, just as someone who's not really experienced with goblins, if I'm playing against this version, like, what do I need to know, right? Like, let's say I have two kill spells that I expect to draw in the opening turns. What am I afraid of here? What should I be looking to do with them? It really depends on the plan of attack the goblin player takes. Like, for example, I would never play a turn to snoop against Murktide. I would just keep my bile on two until I see an opening. On the contrary, against an Ambulet Titan deck, I will immediately go turn one bile, turn two snoop, turn three, try to win. So the goblin deck is able to play a super different game depending on the approach. You can play like a stormy goblin way with the whole master and the skirks. You can play a super value game where you just go turn one vial, turn two Mogwar Marshal, turn three in response to the sack trigger, vial in horn master, get a new draw, cast a matron, get a ringleader, play ringleader, draw three cards, and force you to deal with an army of one ones that just keep coming. If you do find yourself in a matchup that's just racing to do something non-interactive. Turn two snow, turn three harbinger, or turn one skid, turn two horde master, turn three banneret, and try to go off with a mogwar marshal. Any of the two combo ways. You can do it by turn three is a possible. Turn three kill is possible. Yeah, turn three kill is super possible. I mean, you have snow plus harbinger. Well, you have one harbinger. Yeah, but you have four matrons, which means if you have a skid, you have enough panel to win on turn four with a vial or anything, on turn three with a vial. Like, there's a lot of ways where it just happens. It's also worth remembering, you have a lot of nip tricks, like Mogwar Marshal plus Kill Prospector is a mana ritual. You literally go up on mana by sacrificing a Mogwar Marshal. If you have a Skill Prospector, Matron only costs two because you can sacrifice itself. The other day, one of our most known brewers in our Discord, um, Bombard Courier, was, he said he exiled all the fetchables in his deck because he had a Snoop on turn two, an opponent played an Oldstone, and they made like 20 copies with a Horde Master. Because they just found the Kiki on top. 
And the play was just like infinite snoops. And when they start dying one by one on your end step, the whole master triggers go into the stack. And when you reveal a sling gun, you sacrifice everything. It goes one at a time. So you have time to choose the card you want on top and then do yeah. everything before the next horde master trigger resolves. Exactly. Then you have the, the mock fanatic and the sling gun lieutenant. It could be two sling guns, but you have to play two pingers in your deck to have access to the combo kill in case you throw one. Same reason you have two kikis. And also having four rune belt makes it so if you find a kiki on top, you don't need to have a, a bogard because a lot of the time if you just have the, the snoop and you find a kiki, unless you have a way to put a sling gun on top, you're not winning. Hormaster works as another way to win. Or skir to make infinite mana, cast a kiki, shiki, and see what happens later. Yeah, that's so fascinating. They, they took a tribe that didn't have a two-mana lord, they gave it a two-mana lord that... Works with cost reduction, provides card advantage, provides this combo potential. I mean, you're talking about scenarios where a single horde master draws your entire deck. Yeah, it's so there's a lot of scenarios where you're just like you mulligan, your opponent tapped out, and you went like turn one by L, turn two, horde master, and it survived, and you top deck a cost reducer, and your last card was a mog war marshal, and you go like, okay, fuck it. Pile in, man in it, cast a one mana mog, exile, exile, draw a matron, play matron, sacrifice matron, cast ring leader, draw another mog, go off. $2 card. Yeah. Fire Horde Masters. Amazing Just card. <laughs> and you should focus your removal always on the Snoop and always on the Horde Masters. You can kill Skill Prospector if you're playing something like Living End. The other day I was able to get a, a Zero Lander win because I kept a Zero Lander with Kalis and Skill Prospector on a Mulligan to 6 and I just threw the land on turn 3, play a turn 3 Skill, turn 4, draw, turn 4, draw nothing, play Living End, I get back my Skill, and I win on turn 5. That's something that the deck just is able to do. Like I went turn one, like I got my skill from a link again, go with two lands, Mogworm Marshall, make three mana, cast a Frog Tosser Banneret plus a Mogworm, another Mog, sacrifice one, play a Horde Master, go off. Yeah, amazing stuff. Well, I'm excited to see you put up even more results with this. I know it's been doing well for you. Yeah, likely playing it in the weekend's challenges. And then we have a list that was able to 5 0, which is even more impressive than anything goblins can do. <laughs> so yes for my pick of the week um another deck that does well against a turn one ragavan we're talking about walls combo walls combo what does this even mean why would you play a walls deck there's two defenders axbane guardian and overgrown battlement that each tap to provide mana equal to the number of defenders you control you get one he's into play you tap for a bunch of mana can you win with that? If you have the card Staff of Domination, three mana artifact, it's just like an infinite mana sink because it has a bunch of expensive tap abilities, but it can untap itself. And it can also untap, it can untap your x Guardian. So for four, five mana, you get to untap your x Four mana or five mana? Well, it's three to activate the staff to untap an x Guardian, plus an extra one to untap the staff. So if you have five defenders, including your Axe Pain or your Overgrattlement, Staff of Domination allows you to not only get infinite mana, but also to draw infinite cards. Right, because the last ability on staff draws a card. So why would you ever want to build a deck like this? This sounds like a recipe for disaster. <laughs> and yet it works. It works for a couple of reasons. Well, one, just amazing deck building from uh, the pilot Jamie JR was the first to 5-0 with this, and people have been picking it up since then. I think uh, the streamer Squad Chief got another 5-0 with it. It just looks like an absurd build, but in order to do that, you have to dump a bunch of defenders into play. So you have Wall of Blossoms, Wall of Roots. These are pretty good cards. You have Collected Company. So you have plenty of ways to like gum up the battlefield. None of these are one drops. So for one drops, uh, we actually are going to play two copies of Ceruli Caretaker, hmm. which is like a spring leaf drum on a wall, and four copies of Walking Bulwark. I'll come back to that in a second. To get more creatures, we have Cord of Calling. Cord finds a bunch of sweet stuff, right? Like typically, when I think defenders, I'm thinking, okay, Arcadia's a strategist. You know, Nasif has been playing some versions of Arcadia's on his on his stream. Two copies of Arcades, sure, that draws cards, that can attack. Um, there's even a Wing Mantle Chaplain, which is like a limited friendly version of creating birds off of your walls. One copy of Trophy Mage, this is, I think, a brilliant inclusion. Trophy Mage can search up the Staff of Domination, or can find the Ensnaring Bridge if you're in trouble. 
And there's even a perimeter captain, which is a one drop defender that uh, provides two life every time you, you block. So you have a lot of actual tutor targets that help you. But the card that really holds it all together is this walking bulwark. Hmm. Surprisingly. You look at this card and you think, yeah, it doesn't seem important. It's just an artifact creature, an O3 golem for one colorless mana. Its activated ability grants haste to one of your walls, and it also gives it the ability to attack and, and deal damage equal to its toughness. It looks too expensive to be a serious consideration, but we already want defenders to up our count for Axebane and Overgrown Battlement. At a certain point in the game, when you have enough defenders, let's say you have the staff in play, but they killed your first Axebane Guardian, a walking bulwark means that the second Axebane Guardian is immediate lethal because you just give haste to the Axebane Guardian, make infinite mana, and then draw your deck. Walking Bulwark, because of that haste ability, also becomes the kill after you've drawn your deck. You know, you, you generate infinite mana, you draw all your deck, you still have to kill them that turn. So you deploy all your cards, play your Walking Bulwark, give everything haste, and then it attacks for lethal. I'm just surprised at how good the Bulwark is. Like, when I saw it in play, I saw most of uh, Squatch's League, and the Walking Bulwark being able to give haste to, like, the Overgrown Battlements and the Axe Guardian became relevant every single game. The worst card in the deck was shockingly Arcadis, if I had to guess. I mean, that's so sad. That's so heartbreaking. But yeah, I mean, Arcadis is the one that comes down last. So you've already deployed your hand. Got a big target on its head. And it's, its plan is kind of different from the more threatening big mana plan. Yeah. And Bulwark already acts as a way to transform your defenders into beatdown creatures because it also has the Arcadis text. It also doesn't work with Collector Company a lot of the time. I wouldn't tutor for it over Chaplain in a stocked board. If you had a cord, you would prefer to get a Wing Mantle Chaplain? Yeah, and I will never cord for 7 if I don't have a board already. Which is the only way you could get it. I would rather just play 2 more Wall of Omens. <sighs> it's so heartbreaking, because, I mean, for how long have we thought Defenders will be fun, but Arcadius does not have enough support? Well, it, maybe Arcadius was a problem. <laughs> Maybe the entire time Arcadis was the card holding the, the deck back. Also, you have the one of beautiful Wall of Denial on the sideboard. What is that for? I don't know, but it stops. Maybe it stops a Murktide? Yeah. I mean, Bulwark blocks Ragavan, Wall of Denial stops Murktide for a little while at least. I also think that's what Recruiter is the worst card in the deck. After Arcadis, because it does nothing. It seems like you don't need it, right? Like, you already have infinite mana sinks, so you don't actually... I would play one, maybe, as a... You know, sometimes when this sort of deck, you come in a position where you have, like, two battlements, two wall works, a wall of lostoms, a wall of roots. Literally, you have 17 mana, and you top deck a Court of Calling. Yeah, I would like to call for that watch and activate four times. But is Wall of Omens just better than the Dusk Watch? <laughs> like... No, no, but... Any defender. Yeah, but getting to look four times, like, I think it's a worthwhile Court of Callings target. I think this deck tends to okay. have scenarios where you just make a lot more mana that, that you can utilize correctly. I don't want to nitpick too much because the deck is so sweet, I'm just amazed that it worked at all. So this is a major brewing achievement Yeah. for Jamie, JR, or whoever initially brewed this list. Yeah, great deck list, and I will likely take it for a spin as soon as I can because it's a Court of Calling Coco deck, how wouldn't I? Also very cheap to build if you're looking for something for FNM. <laughs> yeah. Zero interaction of any kind is a bit scary, but that's for cowards. You can just collect Coco for Trophy Mage and play a Snaring Reach. Be a man. Or a woman. <laughs> just have what it takes. Blocking is great these days. <laughs> you can block! I don't know if you can block at 11, 11 Infect Flyer, but that's what Snaring Reach is for. All right, so we have one good pick of the week, the, the Goblins Frog Tosser Banneret deck, and one sweet pick of the week in the form of Walls Combo. <laughs> Both rattled off 10 O's in their own style. Both combo decks in its beauty. Creature combo decks. And then we have the monthly project. Yeah, our last order of business for today. So when we last saw Rivaz of the Claw... You, myself, and, and Zach were doing some research, right? We were going through all the options for the Dragon Tribe. Weren't super optimistic about assembling like a winning deck, right? And I think people in our Discord who took up the challenge 
felt similarly. We got a lot of one fours. We have to issue an apology to to our listeners. <laughs> Lots of lost tickets have been burned on the Pyro of Rivaz of the Claw. Reviews have not been good for this cardboard. Hmm. Sadly, no one seems to be super excited on the Rivaz train. I think that's mostly on its, uh, as you're going to complain about shortly, its colors of mana. Well, I think that it was put most succinctly by LAA11, who also contributed a 1-4 result and <laughs> said that Ravaz fails on two counts. One is that Ravaz itself is bad, and two, it, it forces you to play dragons, which are also bad. So you just end up with kind of a, a disastrous deck. But that's not going to stop us from trying. So what happened? Well, after we recorded that first show, uh, Mana Symbol, Zach, dutifully took notes, put together his own version of a pioneer list based on things that we talked about, based on also a list that uh, the streamer Freak You Nasty had proposed that was trying to play more like Gruel Ramp with Elvish Mystic, Lenore Elves, Kiora, and Glorybringer. And Zach did his best to like accommodate Revaz on the mana base, you know, splash some dragons. I think he had a, like a Rith in there. He had Dragon Lord Tarka. He had a lot of pain lands. He was trying to use like the tribal lands with Secluded Courtyard took it into the league and you know he didn't have great results i think i think by the end he um he was in the 04 drop bracket and a, a bit frustrated with the deck or perhaps a pioneer itself <laughs> so he didn't give good reviews but i went back yesterday and just like watched the tape okay right you can still review the games and as i was watching the matches the amazing thing about it was that even though he went 04 like he kind of went 3-1 like the first match <laughs> He lost because his opponent top decked their fourth Bone Crusher Giant on the very last. Okay. Like they had a one outer in the deck, they they hit it. And he said this. He's like, okay, I'm not gonna worry too much about that. I'm 0-1, but you know, basically should have been 1-0 based on the odds. Second match against Lotus Combo, you always lose by one turn against Lotus Combo. Again, is about to win the match, he comes up one damage short, the Lotus Combo player wins on their next turn. But I was like actually looking at the attacking sequence of the previous two turns. Actually, there was a way to get two more damage in. <laughs> which didn't seem like it was going to matter with the time, but, I mean, the, these little little sequences like that. So even though he's 0-2, he's kind of 2-0. Third match, the mana base is just crushing him throughout the league, right? His opponent steals a Dragon Lord of Tarka with a Crow War, attacks and throws an Ember Cleave on it, which is hilarious. But also, like, Zach would have survived that, except that his secluded courtyard did not tap for red to cast as a braid. So he just died because of the mana base. Again, like, the mana was just a, a Achilles heel and didn't seem like that bad of a shell. So I, I felt like, all right, if I feel this way, I should at least try to prove it. So I made some of the changes. Zach had recommended some fixes to the mana base. I made my own tweaks to get the numbers where I wanted, get a little more creature lands in there, changed up some of the fun ofs that Zach was playing for the ones that I wanted to try and decided to build my own version of what is functionally a gruel ramp deck splashing for Rivaz. Okay. And for me, this deck was pretty good. Like, I got the three wins, which <laughs> I think this was a record for our pioneer attempts. We had a lot of one fours and like only a couple two threes so far in the Discord. <laughs> this is the best pioneer result we have posted so far with Revaz. A, a strong 3 2, but it was actually strong. Like, I won game one, I think, almost every match. A strong 3 2, not a weak one. A strong 3 2, yeah dominated against two blue white decks against a, a control deck and a spirits deck uh beat goblins lost very close matches against angels and vehicles got to do a bunch of fun stuff like a lot of the stuff that i put into the deck to just see if it would work we are basically talking about okay you play your elf on turn one you play kiora on turn two ideally and then you play Gl glory bringer and win this is the core that we've been doing since the beginning of the podcast hmm. we started in modern we've been trying it in all formats it's still good you need more three mana rampers, so I was playing two Domries, three Revaz, two Fable of the Mirror Breaker. To complement the Glory Bringers, you need more dragons, so I was playing three Gold Spans, one Corvold, one Kolagon the Storm's Fury, and one Sarkon the Masterless. A fun of Phyrexian Dragon Engine and a fun of Shivan Devastator. Hmm. I was trying to stick to an Obosh compatible list. Um, Zach was playing Dragon's Fire in his build, but the Dragon's Fire uh, didn't look that impressive, so I just replaced them with a couple strangles, and a light up the night, which is actually hilarious with your planeswalkers. <laughs> with this amount of planeswalkers. 
Yeah, and it's not like a huge amount of planeswalkers. It's three heroes, two domaries, one Sarkhan. But, you know, I did get these into play multiple times. I did get to double up my Light of the Night with Obosh in play for 12 damage off of Flashback, which was amazing. I got to do a bunch of fun stuff, right? I got to use Kiora to untap Rivaz to, like, produce four mana off a single Rivaz. I got to use Rivaz to attack and block, where the Planeswalker options wouldn't have been able to affect the board in the same way. I got to use Sarkon 5 to, like, animate three Planeswalkers at once. I even got to try Temple of the Dragon Queen, which was a, a card recommended by First Turn Negator in our Discord, as it being, like, actually pretty decent um, three mana option. It's like a Fable Patches that doesn't require you to play basic lands, which is kind of nice. Okay. So I did all this stuff, right? I used my treasures from Goldspan Dragon to fuel the Corval. All the fun I was work- were working. I didn't get to do everything, right? I didn't actually ever draw the Kolagon or the Shivan Devastator uh, or the Frakshian Dragon Engine, so not sure about those. And sadly, I'm sad to say, I never actually recast a dragon from the graveyard with Rivaz. <laughs> so it was mainly just a, hmm. a mana ramper that has menace and three toughness. But the shell worked, right? Like, the power was there. Did you get to recast anything from the graveyard? Oh, no. Never? <laughs> That's sad. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not even once. But, like, what are the takeaways? Okay, so the Glorybringer Kiora mana elf shell was still good and that solved like one of the questions right so LLA11 had said it forces you to play dragons and dragons are bad but this reminded me that Glorybringer is actually not bad we can play the good dragons is one of the few that's still a good dragon well Corval was good gold spans were so-so it really depended on the situation I did you know, I'm playing 10 five drops, which is not something you really want to do. So I did have a lot of weird hands. I mulliganed all the time, partly because of the weird curve, partly because, damn, the mana sucks. Like, splashing into a third color when you're also trying to play a land war elf is just a disaster. I do have to conclude that splashing for Rivaz was not actually worth it. Like, if it's just ramping mana, I can do that without splashing into black. While I'm glad that I actually was able to achieve the mythical 3-2 <laughs> with this build, I think that my next attempt at Rivaz is not going to be this strategy. It's going to just shift into just pure Rakdos. Rivaz is not worth stretching the mana, so let's just stick to Rivaz's own colors. Hmm. Let's slow the game down. We're not trying to ramp anymore. We'll maybe play Thoughtseize. We'll play Fatal Push. Orb of Dragonkind, the two-mana ramper, is a card that uh, people in our Discord have been giving good reviews to. I'm still interested in this Kolagon Storm Fury plus Phyrexian Dragon Engine. I think that that's a very interesting curve to me. If you play the Dragon Engine on three, any dragon on turn four, dash Kolagon on turn five, uh, that should be lethal damage if you played like a 4-4 four, four dragon on turn four. So maybe like maybe that's something to explore. There's a card called Maniform Hellkite, which um, Lurking Evil in our Discord has been getting some interesting results with that spits out little mini dragons with haste. I think that could be an interesting option to make this Kolagon line work as well. So maybe a deck like that is where I will try next. That sounds amazing. That sounds like maybe the best way. It's definitely going to be slower. I think the reason that I liked this Gruul or this Jun version was that between Mana Ramp, Kiora, and Glorybringer, you can just run away with the game. Hmm. You can just stomp somebody and leave them feeling like they didn't have a chance. And I don't think a Rakdos version will ever do that. It's just going to be like a more mid-rangey, grindy style. But that's what Rivaz does. I mean, he does a little bit of this, a little bit of that. He plays in different board states. He's sadly a bit too medium at everything. Three mana, three, three. Has a keyword, menace, which has to be like the most medium keyword of them all. Taps for two mana, only for dragons. Allows you to get back from the graveyard, but only stuff that costs a shit ton of mana because it's dragons. He looks like a build around, but he's more of a supporting player who's... Yeah, he's a supporting player trying to maximize his utility. Sadly, in a bit too many ways. And it does come down to, you have to find dragons that you're actually happy to include in the deck. Hmm. Glorybringer is really the only dragon I've found so far that fits that. I'm hoping that the Phyrexian Dragon Engine, if I play four copies and like three Kolagans, maybe four Maniform Hellkite... I'm hoping that that actually amounts to something, but it's possible I'll, I'll hate it. <laughs> we'll see. It's possible it will do nothing. Yeah. The card Cut to Ribbons was the sweet tech from Lurking Evil. 
cut is like a playable removal spell, but ribbons, although it sucks, is a way to just spend mana from the graveyard, as much mana as you have. Mana from Hellkite rewards you for that. I was wondering if a uh, Smoldering Egg could be another card that's a dragon that rewards you for just spending mana randomly. So there's there's something to play with in like a slower Rakdos build. I think that's what I will explore next. Okay. That let you hear that there's hope. There's some hope. I mean, you also got a 3-2, right? Yeah, yeah. Although not in Pioneer. I got a 3-2 with a good old Magda changelings tech list where I tried to fix most of Riva's problems because A, it can get back cheap stuff instead of really expensive stuff. When you get mana from it, you can actually double cast spells from it. And then the mana is eh. <laughs> So Riva's is just hanging out with the changelings, right? There's no other dragon stuff happening. Yeah, my only issue with Rivas is it itself not being a dragon in that deck. Does that matter? It matters with Cavern of Souls and mana based shenanigans. I see. So you played this list, you got a 3 2, but did Rivas do anything or was Rivas just sort of along for the ride? It was, eh, it was a bit worse than the other supporting players I have tried. Like, it, I was covered by the Magda change thing because I played against non-interactive decks and I had a lot of cans of turn 1 Mothvas into turn 2 Magda. Where Rivas, yeah, we, I, Rivas won me two games just by being a player that allowed me to recast a Mothvas change thing. So you get a Lurus. Yeah, yeah, in this deck it was like a Lurus light. That's why it's good, because you can recast your changelings for only one mana, and that's actually super useful when what you're getting back is actually good cards that only cost one, and they're good supporting pieces. But yeah, looking forward, I'm like 99% likely to just play the Rat Horde Master in that slot. Oh, the Karamonix, the Rat King. Looking at five cards deep. Rat Ring Leader. Yeah, Rat Ring Leader has to be like the most efficient price for that effect we have ever seen. It's one deeper than Ring Leader for one less mana with a 3-3 three, three party to boot and Toxic 1 to all my changelings. And it finds more copies of itself. Yeah, yeah, it's like perfect. What else can you ask for? Rats better than dragons, confirmed. Yeah, rats better than dragons and that's super bad for dragons. I mean... <sighs> When I played against the Angels deck, so I won the first game with that light up the stage Obosh line, but the second two games were were not good. <laughs> just looking at the Angel tribe, all their creatures cost two and three, and they just get way bigger than dragons. Like, damn, they did dragons dirty. Like, how come Angels got all these cheap good cards, and, and dragons were like <laughs> struggling with these weak ass three mana ramp cards? They were collecting companying into like a massive board state and fifty life. Yeah, dragons is struggling as a tribe. Sadly, dragons and Rivas the Kobold are struggling. He's not a Kobold, he's a Viashino Warlock. Viashino, sorry. Not even a Dragonborn. The Viashino Warlock. <laughs> maybe Warlocks, maybe that's the new tribe. <laughs> it can't even be a wizard. Yeah. And yeah, with that being said, I think that's all for us tonight. This evening, rather. We're almost ready for a new card of the month. I'm going to try to squeeze one more playable Rivas deck out of the card, but I think everyone's ready for something new at this point. <laughs> but yeah, we're also going to be diving into Phyrexia All Will Be One Brews. We're going to be looking at Tyvar Jubilant Brawler. There's a lot of brewing coming your way. Exactly. Thanks so much, everybody, and hope to see you again soon. All right, take care, Morg. Take care. Bye-bye. Deck list for this episode can be found at our homepage, faithlessbrewing.com. And tune in next time for our brew session featuring Tyvar Jubilant Brawler. Support for this podcast is provided by brewers like you. Join the Faithless family and help support the show at patreon.com slash faithlessbrewing for Discord access, bonus content, and more. That's all for today. Stay safe and we'll see you next time.